Welcome to the Workology Podcast, where we discuss the science and art of the workplace, gain powerful insights, resources, and perspectives on the industries of human resources and recruiting. Join your host, Jessica Miller-Merrill, Chief Blogger at bloggingforjobs.com, for an in-depth and no-holds-barred look into the future of our most powerful business asset, the employee. And now, welcome your host, Jessica, with this podcast episode of Workology. Welcome to the Workology Podcast. Thank you for making us part of your week. Today, we're going to be discussing a very important topic, which is transgender employees in the workplace. You might have read the news last week or uh, when this goes live a couple weeks ago, particularly where Bruce Jenner announced his himself or herself as Caitlyn Jenner. So we're going to be talking about employees in the workplace, particularly with regard to the transgender workplace. And one of the other reasons outside of Caitlyn Jenner is that OSHA also released a bathroom best practices guide for transgender workers and their management teams. I want to go ahead and introduce our guest who's going to be guiding us through the, the topic of transgenders in the workplace is Mary Wright. Welcome, Mary, to the podcast. Thank you very much. Mary is an employment lawyer with over 25 years in experience in counseling employers on human resource issue, issues, most recently with the number one law firm in the nation for labor and employment. You might know Ogletree Deacons. So welcome to the podcast. Is there anything else out of the intro that I might have failed to mention that you wanted to share with our listeners? I, I'm just thrilled to be here. And I, and I have I, I practice predominantly in the area of advice and counsel and predominantly in California, although my, the law firms that I've worked at have a national uh, client base. So I deal a lot with federal law and California law, and this is an issue that is just now hitting the peak, uh, especially with the advent of Caitlyn Jenner and the publication of OSHA's new guidelines. I think it's a a great topic to be talking about, and I really want this podcast to be something that people will be able to go back to and listen at their leisure just to kind of give them some background information and maybe some resources because the to- this topic is something that we're going to be seeing more and more mainstream. I, I know that in the early 2000s, I was working in HR for a, a major corporation, and-, and I was myself approached by an employee who was going through a transgender change. They wanted to talk to me about the change in the bathroom and questions from their managers and team members. And at the time, there really were no resources or certainly best practices for this type of thing. So let's talk a little bit about this. Let's talk about OSHA's best practices guide in particular. There's a lot of language in the guide about sanitation standards. Is that what we should be focusing on or is there more to that in in the guide? It's very timely because I will tell you that there are basically three, there are three or four issues that arise with transgender or transition from one gender to another in the workplace. And, of course, the bathroom issue is the big one because it has to do with the impact on other people. And the, uh, the other issues about, you know, uh, names, pronouns, dress code, things like that, are related to the transgender person themselves. But the use of the bathroom tends to impact and inflame the emotions of other people in the workplace. I'm not saying everybody. Most people take this in stride. I don't mean to uh, sound like it's a a big drama because for most people it isn't. We just want to be competent in the way that we deal with it. OSHA's best practice comes from this, comes at this issue, not from whether it's right or wrong to discriminate against individuals, but for an employee safety uh, viewpoint because that's, of course, what OSHA is, is an occupational safety regulation. And it approaches this from the viewpoint of what's safe for the worker and what's safe for his co- his or her colleagues and what's safe for the public at large having to interact with products and food or whatever manufactured by the individual. It doesn't talk about what's right or wrong or discrimination or whatever. It talks about what makes the workplace safe. Uh, OSHA recognizes that there are consequences and we're all human beings. We all need to use the restroom and we have a right when we're at work to have access to a sanitary facility. And you, I'm sure you've seen, if you go out into rural America and you see people working in the fields, you're going to see the ubiquitous porta potty that is being pulled by a trailer so that the people who work in the fields will have access to a sanitary bathroom. The failure to have access to a sanitary bathroom causes all kinds of problems. First of all, it's a health problem to the individual because 
after all we're human, we have to go to the bathroom, you're, one of two things happens. You're either going to hold it, which causes all kinds of problems like urinary tract infections, bowel impaction, all kinds of health risks for the individual, or alternatively, you're going to use the restroom where you are, which causes sanitation issues, not only for the person who's using the restroom, but also the workers, or including the product that could be making, um, you know, food product at a processing plant or, you know, so sanitation affects all areas. And although this isn't a law uh, specifically uh, or a best practice specifically about discrimination, it is intended to acknowledge that, that people who are transgender have the right to have access to a bathroom to their transgendered identity, meaning if you're transgender female or transgender male, you should be entitled to use the bathroom for your target gender. Um, and just for the record, when referring to someone who's transgender, you refer to them as transgender female if their goal is female and transgender male if their target gender is male. So during the course of this podcast, we'll be talking about transgender male and transgender female. We all want everyone to have access to the bathroom. And so the bathroom is, is probably the first and foremost question that gets asked about uh, when working, you know, addressing transgender issues in the uh, workplace. In reality, the OSHA's best practice is identifying a safety issue that impacts all workers in, and instructs employers on the best practice for handling transgendered employees. And it's also an acknowledgement that gender identity, gender expression, biological sex, all of those issues are all wrapped up in the transgender issue and everyone regardless of which you fall under, uh, is entitled to access to a sanitary facility. We're already seeing this topic beyond OSHA's guidelines being discussed in California. In January of 2014, the School Success Opportunity Act passed, which provides guidance to schools so that it can make sure that transgender students, like all students, have the opportunity to select which bathroom uh, they they want to be using. So um, if my daughter, who's now in kindergarten, and we were still in California there, uh, where we just moved back from to Oklahoma, she would have the option to be able to select with which bathroom she wanted to use, uh, regardless of if she was kindergarten all the way up to 12th grade. See, that is to build in cultural competence and to, under, to build in understanding of what we need to know about gender identity in general. Because kids that don't have this cultural overlay, at least not at the age of your child, or have a cultural overlay um, about which one they have to use, which one is expected to use. You know, the easiest way to understand gender is to dissect it into sort of three different char characteristics. One is biological sex, and that's which bits you're born with. You know, what is the physical sex characteristics that make up your body? You know, do you have a vagina? Do you have a penis? Those are very, that's your biological sex. And then there's, then there's a really confusing area of the law, which in California we have as a protected class, and that is gender expression. We have the bit of one sex, our biological sex may be one, but we choose to present our gender through our actions, dress, and demeanor based upon, based upon what, how, you know, our personality. Gender expression, let's just take it a step further. If you think about Katherine Hepburn back in the, I'm going to be terrible on the dates here, the 30s or 40s, when she started wearing pants on the movie set, that was a gender expression. She dressed in a way that was slightly out of character for her biological sex, but she was expressing her gender in a way that was not sort of the cultural norm. In, in California, we have laws that protect people in their gender expression uh, because we don't, want to, we don't want to punish people because they don't act feminine enough, they don't dress femininely or they don't dress masculine enough or they don't behave in a manly way. Those are expressions, outward expressions of what may be going on inside a person and, and it may be um, a, an expression of what our gender identity is. And gender identity is the third thing. This is the first bio biological sex, which is cut and dried, which bits do you have? And then there's gender expression. Well, how are you going to express 
to your uh, your personality, your gender personality. And the third is your actual identity. And that's how you, in your head, define your gender. Gender identity is who you who you know you are based on how much you align or don't align um, with what is understood to be the gender norm in your culture, like Catherine Hepburn wearing pants. But gender identity is how, regardless of how culture sees you on the outside or which, which uh, genitalia you were born with, how you believe you are on the inside. And gender expression and gender identity are very complicated. Um, it's a way of classifying and expressing personality uh, because our sex is tied up in what our personality is. You know, the gender expressions differ from community to community, country to country. What may be, you know, overtly feminine or masculine in one country may not be in another, such as the custom of holding hands in men in some Middle Eastern countries. That's not an expression of gender. That's an expression of, of uh, friendship. So, but in this country, in the U.S., it's an expression of our our uh, gender identity and um, our gender expression, our personality. So those are the kinds of things that we need to understand about transgender and gender identity going forward in this country. And select having children select which bathroom is an indicator of which gender expression they have and which gender identity uh, they have. And that transgender can be separate from gender identity. You don't have to be one or the other. Absolutely. Absolutely. You can have, you know, there's mo- just like different personalities, there are multiple, multiple types of personalities. There are multiple types of expressions of gender identity and gender um, expression. For instance, you could be a straight female dressing as a male, a straight male dressing as a female. You could be a gay male dressing, having, you know, wearing eye makeup and earrings. And you know, it just, it doesn't, it's, there are a multitude of ways of expressing your gender and what you feel about your gender. That's why we need to break down the stereotypes of the way a man is supposed to act and look and a, a way a woman is supposed to act and look. I mean, to a certain extent, it will, it will never go away because we the majority of us are biologically wired a certain way. But, um, well, I guess we're all biologically wired a certain way. We just have different cultural norms. So, um, but I think it, I think we're beginning to have some better understanding that just because you're born in one identity doesn't mean that you're going to stay that identity. You may be able to change gender uh, during your lifetime. You mentioned Katherine Hepburn, and a recent example would be Will, Will Smith's son, Jaden, who uh, stepped out in April in a woman's dress and then posted pictures on Instagram that he's been also shopping for some girl clothes lately. So um, I think they're both great examples of kind of maybe the direction that we're, we're going past and present. Art mirrors life or art precedes life or however you want to say it. But, you know, in, when we were all, at least my generation, uh, when we were reading science fiction in the 60s, everyone was androgynous. There was no ability to tell what sex the person would be when you read science fiction and you look into the future. But science fiction has become science fact. And that, and that, uh, oh, that quote in a movie, I think, um, when you look at the way people dress now, it is much more androgynous than it was when I was growing up. You know, young girls are dressed in sweatpants and athletic gear from the time they're able to walk or even before. And and colors are not, you know, people are not bound by colors. Like you can dress men in red and pink and maroon and, and lavender and all of those colors that were predominantly female when I was growing up. So we are seeing that. Now, that is different than a man putting on a dress and going out in public. That is contrary to current gender norms. But, you know, if he's comfortable and that's what that's what makes him happy and he doesn't have that gender expression tied to a cultural norm, then hey, he's on the forefront of probably what's going to come. Let's talk about some situations or maybe some issues that might occur in the workplace in regard to maybe uh, transgender employees. I, I think retaliation is definitely one, but what kind of things might we expect if we have a situation where an employee has, has announced that they're going to be going through a transition? I wrote an article, I may even have posted on blogging for jobs, but I see five different areas in which transgender is going to have the biggest impact. The first is the bathroom, because as I said before, it impacts other people. 
The second is names. How do you change your name? How do you get acceptance of the name? And the third one is pronouns. How do you change your pronouns to he to she or she to he and get everybody to accept it? Then there's the more subtle things like hostility and retaliation. How do you prevent people from being hostile to the transgender person because they feel well, they feel threatened or they just don't, there's a religious bias or a cultural bias against the person who is changing or has changed gender. And then finally, ultimately, there is the privacy issue. And I think privacy is what drives questions about the bathroom and how to get names and pronouns right, because you're talking about how it's announced and how it's handled and the per- everyone's right to privacy and their beliefs. Agreed. Well, let's take a little bit of a reset here. This is Jessica Miller Merrill, and you're listening to the Workology podcast powered by Blogging for Jobs. Today's topic is transgender in the workplace. And we're here with Mary Wright. You can connect with Mary on LinkedIn. It's just linkedin.com forward slash in forward slash Mary, M A R Y E W R I G H T. All right, let's get back to things here. Let's talk about some steps employers are obligated to take when an employee tells them that they are transgender and plan to go through a change. That's a good question. There isn't an awful lot in the statute or the regulations that talk about what an employer has to do. Uh, But one of the things that's interesting is that I'm an advice and counsel lawyer. I spend most of my time on the phone talking to people about, you know, what is the best practice they should adopt, what, you know, what what should they do uh, to prevent a, a, a problematic situation developing, to prevent people from getting their feelings hurt, which of course translates into anger, and of course that translates into lawsuits. So one of the things that I recommend, um, I have a lot of experience in handling situations in which an employee comes to me and tells me that they are, or tells the employer that they are disabled. Now, I am not equating the, uh, the transition process or the transgender process to being disabled. But what I am saying is, is that when you are dealing with a person who is disabled, or who presents themselves as being disabled, the employer is obligated to engage in an interactive process with that person. They have to ask some pretty, you know, bald questions about what the person can and cannot do, and what they want to, what they want to see, what they want disclosed to, in the workplace. And so I tell people, I think the best practice, and, and that works really well. I mean, it's a situation where the courts have all weighed in on it. The HR is trained to do that sort of thing. So it's something they feel very familiar and comfortable with, that interactive process. So I tell people that when you're presented with something new in the workplace, such as someone comes to you and says, I am going to transition, or I am transitioning, or I, have, I am transgendered, then you engage that person in the same sort of interactive dialogue. You, you don't necessarily ask them personal questions about why they did it or, you know, what's it like or anything like that. You're not interviewing the person for what they're feeling emotionally. But what you want to talk about is what would they like to see happen? Do they want it announced in the workplace? Is, should they put out an official email? Is that what you would like to see happen? Do you want us to not address it at all and let you talk to the individuals, um, reminding them, of course, that once the employer uh, steps out of the picture of a, the announcement, it, you lose the ability to be consistent in the message. So we really, you know, try to craft some kind of announcement that can can be mutually agreed upon. You ask the person, you know, what they would like to see happen, what what they, how they would like to be treated, what name they want to be called, they're going to be going by, um, and uh, what you know, what pronouns and and all of that. So you have an interactive process with someone, and you try to get consensus and of all the parties that are necessary to the agreement, the supervisor, the employee, the uh, human resources person, and you try to develop a plan for going forward. Because if you can get buy-in and consensus from all the party, the transition is much easier for the person involved. It it uh, alleviates a lot of the stress that the individual is feeling. And once you alleviate that stress and convince the person, you have to mean it, of course, but you convince the person that you are really looking for the best possible solution of how to go forward uh, in the transition or transgender process, I think you go a long way in alleviating the problems uh, in the workplace. And so that's what I would suggest to people is that they – uh, agree upon pronouns, names, bathrooms, uh, how it's announced, all of that beforehand in a very transparent way. And allow the person to correct you 
if 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 they think that that something's not being handled properly, allow them to speak up and say, no, I'd prefer it to be handled this way instead. I'm thinking about things like some dress code change, maybe making some updates. Um, uh, regarding that. And then also, uh, particularly like if they're going to have hospital visits or hospital stay, uh, those kind of things w- would fall under FMLA. That's correct. The transition process for, you know, hormonal therapy and, you know, they have to have, psychi- they have, to have psychiatric counseling to determine the level of seriousness and commitment to the process, especially if they're going to have gender reassignment surgery. And, and they have to have uh, they have to have time off to for recovery, time off for the surgery, time off just you know for whatever whatever coping mechanism they're they're going to have to have to get through the transition process, and that would be covered under the Family and Medical Leave Act. That's the Federal Job Protection Act Leave Act, and then there's the State Act, like the California Family Rights Act, or the um, but whatever state equivalent is in the state that you're living, that your readers or, or listeners are living in, and um, there can be different laws for different states. But yes, it would definitely be covered. If the surgery definitely would, and I believe that the uh, the transition time and treatment would be covered as well. You mentioned dress codes, and that brings up something really interesting. I mean, you don't discipline women for wearing pants, and I had. I had someone actually ask me, you know, we would, if a guy walked in wearing a dress like, and he actually used the word Uncle Milty, if your listeners are probably too young to remember it was a big shtick for Milton Berle to dress as a woman, and he called, they called him Uncle Milty or something like that. But the employer asked me, we would send somebody home because this is not, you know, the, the Saturday night review show. This is a place of employment. And I think that is a false front. I think that people need to get over themselves in that regard. I think that people can easily discern someone who's wearing a costume and is coming in to do a comedy routine versus somebody who is coming in seriously dressed as their target gender. And um, it may require some acknowledgement that there's professional conduct taking into consideration or not with, or with respect to cultural norms, but also and to the extent permitted or required by law with regard to other situations such as transgender and transitioning. You mentioned Uncle Milty. I immediately thought of Bosom Bunnies, where the, the two guys, uh, right. to get the apartment, dress up as women. That's right. It's very funny when men dress as women. I mean, it is a, an accepted comic shtick for men to appear in drag. But the funniness of it isn't that they are acting like women. But the funniness is, is they are totally men dressed as women, whereas people who are transgender, they're going from men to transgender women, they are definitely having gender expression uh, for women. Uh, they're not acting like, you know, uh, the characters in Bosom Buddies or Uncle Milty, where it's funny because look at me, I'm such a man and I'm dressed as a woman. It's exactly the opposite. Look at me, I'm a woman. I'm dressed like a woman. I'm acting like a woman. And I think that I think that it would be pretty easy to tell. And you could make accommodation for that in your policy, written policy if you felt it was necessary. I, I think you can definitely tell when you look at the, the pictures of Caitlyn Jenner. She is definitely a woman and, and not anything else. That's exactly right. And on top of that, when you, if you were to speak with her and interact with her, her expression of her personality would be female. It wouldn't be, look at me, I'm a man dressed as a woman. Look at me, I am now a woman dressed as a woman. And I think that that you could, uh, barring complete cultural insensitivity or oblivion to gender norms, I think most people would be able to tell the difference very quickly. Let's talk a little bit about a 2012 decision with Macy versus Holder. Can you talk a little bit about that case and, and how the anti- trans bias um, in the sex discrimination under Title VII? Absolutely. Right. Uh, Mia Macy, a transgender female, that means male to female, um, applied for a job with, I always get this name wrong, the uh, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives. I mean, that's, I just, it's a really long name and I always forget it, but I'll just call it the Bureau from now. And 
when she when she applied, she was expressing gender norms. In other words, she what she was in her pre transition phase and presented as male. She applied for the for the job while a male, and then later during the process of application, she received word from the bureau that she'd been hired pending her background check which is, you know, common. Everybody does it, but the government really does a super-duper one. And Macy at that time told them, because it was going to come out in the, in the gender background, or in the background check, not gender background check, the background check, it would come out that she was transitioning. And in fact, when she came back in to talk to them about it, she presented as transgender female. At that time, the Bureau withdrew the offer and told her that the position was no longer funded. In other words, it was not going to be offered to anybody. And, you know, unfortunately for Ms. Macy and for the Bureau, uh, th- that was quite probably a pretext because they did, in fact, fill the position, and it was filled by a man. Uh, Macy filed her complaint directly with the Bureau because they have an internal mechanism for resolving disputes, and the... the um, the Bureau split the claim. It said that, that we will send your discrimination and harassment claim to the EEOC, but since the EEOC or Title VII doesn't cover transgender issues, we're going to try and work that out in our internal uh, conciliation program. Well, needless to say, she didn't get satisfaction from the internal con- conciliation program, and the EEOC took it up, and it pronounced that uh, gender identity and gender expression, as well as transgender status, were protected classifications under Title VII. But the, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, that's Title VII. And since that time, there have been regulations and guidelines that now say that those issues create a protected classification for the individual. For the individual. Pursuant to that decision, um, discrimination based on gender identity change of sex or transgender status constitutes a species of sex discrimination, which violates Title VII. It was a huge decision. Um, California, of course, had recognized sexual orientation before Title VII did, and we recognized transgender issues before Title VII did, but now the transgender issues apply across the nation, and it's a, it's a right uh, created by Title VII for e- everyone in the U.S to be free from discrimination, harassment, and retaliation based upon transgender issues. I think that this topic is going to garner more discussion, and there's a lot of uh, uncharted territory, and and we're going to see more of these kind of questions and situations arising in the workplace. Absolutely. Uh, I think that, you know, as long as there's the Internet, and we make, uh, we make a, uh, we go send things viral that are, uh, issues related to transgender, such as the the Will Smith child and the the uh, uh, Caitlyn Jenner issue, and a myriad of other people who have gone to, who have become, who have transgendered or changed their gender. I think that now that we have the vehicle where everything is instantly known, um, you will see continuing questions and fights back and forth based on culture, based on religion, based on privacy based on safety, everything is going to come to the forefront. And it'll get resolved like everything else. Although, you know, we all thought race was resolved with the passage of Title VII, and we know that that's now not true, that we still have a significant race uh, relations problem in this country. Well, Mary, thank you so much for taking the time to, to talk with us about this topic. I think it's an important one for, for discussion. It was my pleasure. And if anyone wants to follow up with me, you can find me on LinkedIn under Mary Wright. You can tweet to me at lawyer for employer, and that's a numeral four, lawyer for employer. I'd be happy to uh, connect up and and have further dialogue on this issue. And please, if you are a transgender person or contemplating it and you think I've gotten something wrong, I sure hope you will contact me because I want to get it right. Absolutely. Uh, Educate us and and share with us so that we can make sure that we're sharing with our peers and colleagues uh, the right information, uh, certainly. Uh, I want to thank everyone for joining the Workology podcast, where we discuss the science and art of the workplace, HR and recruitment. This is Jessica Miller-Merrill. And until next time, you can visit bloggingforjobs.com to listen to all your previous Workology podcast episodes. Thanks, guys. Have a great day.
Production services for the Workology podcast with Jessica Miller-Merrill provided by Total Picture Media.